That's, well, that's pretty pa pathetic. All right, good morning. All right, this morning as we, uh, I want to share just a, I think a helpful, maybe illustration, helpful uh, illustration to help you plow through the wonderful, intriguing book of Leviticus. And uh, it is dry reading, especially when you get to what we're reading today, yesterday, and then some of the uh, laws that we'll get to tomorrow as well. It's like, uh, you know, the priests are having to become health inspectors because of the white hair, the black hair, the runny pus, the, I don't know, it's just way too much stuff going on there. And, uh, and I remember a few years ago, I was thinking about, wow, all this detail. And so it's so uh, tempting to skip over the genealogies in the Bible, the hard reading having to do with laws that in particular we think has nothing to do with us today. And yet they're very important because they give us roots and they link to previous uh, stories in the Bible. And uh, so when our son, who's now 31 years old, when he was eight years old, he, he ate four pieces of dry toast for breakfast every single morning. He's a, he was a trend eater. He'd do things for six months and he'd never repeat it. And so we're in this trend of six months of him eating dry toast for breakfast, no jam, no butter, and I'm feeling like, you know, his cells are not gonna meet together and it's gonna be my fault if he flunks second grade and all these things. And until one day in my frustration of trying to like slap some peanut butter on it, I mean, just anything on that bread, <clears throat> and he's resisting my every attempt. And I picked up the loaf of bread and I read on the side of the, the wrapper, it said, uh, fortified with eight essential vitamins. So, and really, what I saw and understood is my son was actually getting more than I thought he was getting because it was fortified with vitamins and nutrition, even though I thought it was just dry toast at the time. And really, reading the book of Leviticus is an act of submission. It's saying it's God's word. It may be dry. I may feel like I'm not getting anything out of it. But the very fact that I'm reading it, that I'm processing it, gives God unique access to our lives. Anytime when we're in the word of God, God has ready access to speak to our hearts. And so it's just an act of submission, saying, God, your word is living, powerful, sharper than a two-edged sword, even these dry parts. And it's, they have nourishing aspects to that. I don't uh, taste them. They don't feel like they taste good at this moment, but they are beneficial to us. Um, so as we we're in the book of Leviticus, and I was preparing this lecture yesterday, was super frustrating. I woke up at 3.30 in the morning, and it just didn't come together all day long. And I'm thinking I've got to email the, uh, email the handout to Robin and the other people. And so in my desperation, I just like hammered out something. So anyway, I'm sort of going to stay without what I hammered out, but I'm going to fill it in with a few things. So this morning, as we submit ourselves to God's word, and we ask the Lord to speak to our hearts, that God would have unusual access to the inner recesses of our heart that other people don't even know about because that's what the Word of God does. It exposes our motives and the intents of our hearts. And so let's submit ourselves to the Holy Spirit for a searching glance into our lives now. Father, Lord, we acknowledge that you're God and there is none other. You're God declaring the end from the beginning, from ancient times, things not yet done, saying, I will fulfill my purposes and accomplish my good pleasure. God, I thank you that there is no God like you. You are king, you are ruler, you are supreme. Lord, and we bow down this morning. We thank you for the preservation of your word, where we know that we could not know you had not you preserved your word. We'd be guessing and coming up with an idea of you that doesn't look anything like you. So Father, we submit ourselves to your word and we look into the reading of your word today knowing it's a mirror. We'll see ourselves more clearly. Lord, it's a window, we'll see you more clearly. I pray, Father, that your Holy Spirit would take your word, illumine our minds, and I ask this in Jesus' name, amen. Well, uh, just to start with an example, we, we see earlier on in the story, uh, we're introduced to Cain and Abel. And so when you open up chapter four, you had to go back to chapters one through three to understand what is going on because they're coming to God to worship. Now, to understand, what they're doing has to do, is determined by what have their parents taught them about worship. So that scene opens and Abel comes to God and offers him the fat of the firstborn of his flock and it very clearly states that God accepts that offering. But Cain comes in and he offers the fruit from the ground and he presents it to the Lord in an act of worship and God rejects it. Now I've heard so many people who say, oh, I just, God's not fair, I don't understand. I mean, he was given his best. This, it doesn't say it was given his best. Furthermore, God had already established what is an acceptable offering, what is the acceptable form of worship. 
and it always involves substitutionary atonement. So it backs up to what God had did to cover Adam and Eve's nakedness after they sinned against him and after he'd given them the promise of redemption. He took an animal that he had highly esteemed as very good. He obviously slew it, and he used the skins to cover their nakedness. So what you have at the very beginning of the story is God promises through the promise he made through the seed who would come, and then that picture that God himself would bear the cost to cover a man's nakedness. So you have the shedding of the blood of the innocent on behalf of the guilty. And then you have Jesus is referring to Abel as a prophet. So what is Abel prophesying of? Abel's prophesying of the eventual seed who's gonna come and God is gonna set up his death on behalf of guilty sinners and God is gonna clothe us with the very righteousness of Christ. Now, did they understand his name is Jesus? No, but they understood that God had given a promise. Now, anytime that God gives a promise, God is obligating himself fulfill the terms of the promises that he makes. So you have that at the very beginning of the story. So when you come to where we're reading in Leviticus, <clears throat> when God is forming them as a community there during that first year of, in the wilderness, they're camping where Moses has been up on the mountain. He's received the law at Mount Sinai. And he also receives a, a, a bucket full of laws having to do with behavior. And why is this so important to understand? Because you have these, and we looked at this, this last week, they had lived in captivity for the last 400 years, and they have ideas about God that are wrong. Their community is shaped by the pagan culture and the environment in which they lived in Egypt. You'll see, we're not gonna get into this, we're gonna just mention it now, <clears throat> and you'll see it in your reading this next week as we get into Leviticus chapter 18. But God's concern is that his people be a unique people to the Lord, because God is holy, He's established requirements for his people. And so some of those requirements have to do with how did they live? How did they operate in life? So he doesn't want them to be like the Egyptians from which he liberated them. And he doesn't want them to be like the Canaanite people from whom, that, to whose land that he's going to give them. So what you have is God is saying, you know, if you're going to be my people, this is what it's going to look like. And so these types of self-restraint behavior that the instructions that God gives requires is going to shape you and form you as a people where it's a safe community and for, for, for you to live so you can experience flourishing. So you have God gives him and reveals him the design of the tent of meeting. So what you have here is that God just wants to be with his people. God has made a way that God can be in the midst of his people, though he is holy and they are unholy. So you have the revelation there from the earthly, uh, and the, from earth, from the heavenly uh, architecture, the, the tent of meeting where God dwells in all of eternity. And so he reveals that to Moses and he builds a, a replica on earth. So you have a division between where God meets with man over the Ark of the Covenant where the blood is sprinkled on the mercy seat. Then you have a veil separating the most holy place from the holy place where you have the, a lamp, the lamp stand, where you have the, the table of showbread and you have the incense right before that veil. And then you have um, the outside where the, you have the court of meeting, and this is where you have the bronze laver, you have the altar uh, there where the sacrifices are made. And then you have, outside of that, you have a tent that partitions it off, and it's called the tent of meeting or the outer court. And so what you see is God has given them specific design for them to build. And he has poured out his spirit on specific people to oversee the construction of the tent of meeting. And then once it's constructed and all the pieces are there and they're gathered, then it is Moses who goes and he places them in their proper positions there in the tent of meeting. So it is it's constructed, it's completed, it's set up, and then Moses inspects it to make sure it, it meets up with God's requirements. Then you have, as soon as that's done, when he departs, you have the glory of God comes and nestles over the mercy seat. And everybody knows that God is in the house. His glory is imminent right there over the mercy seat. Why is that? Because that is where God meets with humanity is through the shedding of the blood of the innocent on behalf of the guilty. You have where the day of atonement, you're gonna see that in your reading this next week and I think it's gonna be dealt with in your lecture this next uh, week in my absence, but you have the sprinkling on the blood of the mercy seat uh, once time a year and it's done by the high priest who goes in first for himself, acknowledging that he's a dirty, rotten, broken sinner just like everyone else, that he has to come to God through God's established way through the shedding of the blood of the innocent on behalf of the guilty. So God is very specific in what that sacrifice looks like and how it's to be treated. And so then he goes back in the second time and he's now representing the sins of Israel. 
And again, it's through the sprinkling of the blood on the mercy seat that you have. Why? Because that is the place that God meets with humanity. And so what would this do? This would cause us and the Hebrews to erupt with worship. What kind of God would nestle amongst his people? That the holy God, the creator of the universe, would humble himself to dwell with humanity? That was unheard of because there was no God, man-made God in existence who was like that. That God would come near to have the relationship with his people. So you have the glories manifest there of the temple. And so I want us to just read it quickly and then we're gonna deal with a couple of other things in our text. So look at Exodus chapter 40. This was at the uh, very beginning of the week we read this, Exodus chapter 40, verses 34 through 38. Then the cloud covered the tabernacle of meeting, and the glory of the Lord filled the temple. And Moses was not able to enter into the tabernacle of meeting because the cloud rested above it. And the glory of the Lord filled the tabernacle. Whenever the cloud was taken up from above the tabernacle, the children of Israel would go onward on all of their journeys. But if the cloud was not taken up, then they did not journey till the day that it was taken up. For the cloud of the Lord was above the tabernacle by day and far over it by night in the sight of all the house of Israel throughout all their journeys. So it was a manifestation of God's glory amongst his people. How would they know that God is present? Because of his glory that resided there in their midst. And so that there's no way that God wants to jeopardize his meeting with his people. So he established his protocol so that he might remain in their midst. So you have giving the, um, the, the laws he gives about the sacrificial system where he inaugurates the priesthood. But before that, during this, at the end of this conclusion of the first year, they celebrate the Passover. And we read that in our reading this last week, Numbers chapter 9, verses 1 through 14. Why? Because before they ever entered the land, God said, in order for you guys to be an altar people who are altered, it will be centered always on substitutionary atonement. And so it would be based on that 10th plague that God poured out on Egypt where the firstborn of all of Egypt perished. You had the rescue of the firstborn in every Hebrew household if they placed the blood of that lamp on the doorposts and the lentils, signifying that they were substitutionary atonement people. They were defined by substitutionary atonement atonement. And then you have in the sacrificial system in the priesthood, inauguration of the priesthood. And I love this because what you see is the provision of the Levites was in direct proportion to the spiritual welfare health of the children of Israel. Why? Because you had, and, and we were not going to get into the offerings, but in several of the offerings, you see that they were allowed to partake, the priesthood were allowed to partake a part of the offering. So you have the peace offering in particular, it had to be eaten there, but you had the meal in which the priests who were able to uh, participate in. You have also the partaking of the, um, trying to figure out which one I'm seeing on my list. Um, uh, the drink offering uh, there would be shared and benefited there by the Levitical priesthood who were overseeing that as well. Um, you had the wave offer where the priest portion of the peace offering, this is found under peace offering. You had the wave offering, the priest portion of the peace offering was waved before the Lord as a special act signifying that it was his. You have um, uh, the, the, because they wouldn't inherit the land or property, they would have their cities within the 12 tribes there in Israel. So what God was doing is God was providing their needs through the sacrificial system, Okay. So, it would be important when we get to the story of Abihu and Nadab to understand their role as God's representative. And not only that, as they're flourishing provisionally, as directly tied to the sacrificial system and obedience on behalf of the people. So they're interdependent, interdependent upon one another. Now, as a pastor's wife, you know, our, we are compensated based on my husband being the pastor in our church. And you even have this established in the intertestament period of Israel where they would desire to have synagogues where they could have at least minimally 10 families who come together, where those 10 families would each would, gave a 10% and it would support the need of a rabbi in their midst. And so from earlier on, you have this connection between the provisions of the Levite, the priest. For me as the pastor's wife today, I'm so grateful for it. And it's directly 
con connected to the spiritual welfare of the body. So you have this connection here earlier on in the story. Then you have the violation of the priesthood, and this takes place in your reading. We, we read this uh, yesterday. In Leviticus chapter 10, and I want to read this text, and then I want to make some comments uh, about this and make some application for who we are today. So it says, the Nadab and Abihu, the sons of Aram, each took his censer and put fire in it, and he put incense on it, and offered profane fire before the Lord, which he had not commanded them. So fire went out from the Lord and devoured them, and they died before the Lord. And Moses said to Aaron, this is what the Lord spoke, saying, by those who come near me, I must be regarded as holy, and before all the people, I must be glorified. So Aaron held his peace. Then Moses called Mishael and Elzaphon and the sons of Uziel, the uncle of Aaron, and said to them, Come near, carry your brethren from before the sanctuary out of the camp. So they went near and carried them by their tunics out of the camp, as Moses had said. And Moses said to Aaron and to Eleazar and Ithamar, his sons, Do not uncover your heads nor tear your clothes, lest you die, and wrath come upon all the people. But let your brethren, the whole house of Israel, be well the burning which the Lord has kindled. You shall not go out from, uh, from the door of the, of, the, of the tabernacle of meeting, lest you die. For the anointing oil of the Lord is upon you. And they did according to the words of Moses. Now, so what do you have here? Uh, it's interesting because there are no random details in the Bible. And there's also no random placement of those details within the storyline of the Bible. So you have two scenes. You have this scene with Nadab and Abihu in chapter 9. And then you have the scene of the Day of Atonement in, in chapter 16 and 17. And then it's followed by a prohibition. In the same way, in chapter 10, when we have this story, it's followed by a prohibition, which connects the story with the prohibition that God gives afterwards. So let's look at the prohibition that he gives. In verse um, 8, he says, And the Lord spoke to Aaron, saying, Do not drink wine or intoxicating drink you nor your sons with you, when you go into the tabernacle of meeting, lest you die. It shall be a statute forever throughout your generations, that you may distinguish between the holy and the, and the unholy, and between the clean and the unclean, and that you may teach the children of Israel all the statutes which the Lord has spoken to them by the hand of Moses. So what you have here is you see the introduction of this prohibition about intoxication. So you see and understand that intoxication dulls the heart to the boundaries that God has established within worship. You see that intoxication threatens spiritual concentration. Now, <clears throat> the Bible never says don't drink. If you drink, you're going to die. <laughs> no, there are no prohibitions about drinking. In fact, in the book of Proverbs, it talks about that people who are in deep grief and mourning that when they drink, it's why? Because they're in deep grief. And I think this is probably what's taking place with Noah. When he comes off the ark, and you know, time has passed, and he's planted a vineyard, and he gleans from the vineyard, and he ferments the wine, and he drinks it. Now, imagine what it was like for him to experience the colossal death in his midst. Aunts, and uncles, and cousins, and neighbors, and whole neighborhoods, and peoples were wiped out. That's incredible. How do you deal with that on an emotional level? So you see, there seems to be some permission to be able to deal with depths of grief in that way. But I just want to drop something in your heart about that. Because when he was intoxicated, he was absolutely unaware that he was being violated by his son. And in scripture, it says, well, he, had, he and his wife had been intoxicated. His son came in and, and uncovered his nakedness, whatever that is. But it was enough so when he came to himself afterwards, he pronounced a curse, not to him, but to him's son Cain, Canaan, which began um, and gave birth to the Canaanite people. So it must have been something so bad. So what you see is intoxication blurs how we respond to what's going around us. It dismantles our de natural defenses that God has given us. You see that God has given us natural defenses as protections em emotionally and psychologically and also in the area of the sexual realm. So you have this intoxication. Now in Hosea, when Hosea is prophesying to northern Israel before they go into captivity, he makes this statement in Hosea chapter 4, verse 11. Yeah, you are really quiet. You with me? Awesome. So he says, harlotry, wine, and new wine enslave the heart. They take the heart captive. What is he talking about there? 
It dulls the senses. And so when you stop and think about what had happened with Nadab and Abihu, is why they profaned and offered this profane or strained offering to the Lord. They had probably been intoxicated. So therefore, they just, I don't know, picked up some fire in another place besides the altar, which God had mandated. And they put the incense on it and on their censers. And not only that, is only one of them were to offer it to the Lord, but you have them coming in together to offer on the censer. So there's, there are several things about this scene that will help us understand that things are not as they should be. Okay? And so when this happens and when God responds like he does, where the fire that came and settled in their midst that would consume the, alt, the sacrifice on the altar, now that fire has moved in judgment against his representatives there in the, most, in the holy place. So in Isaiah chapter 5, verses 11 and 12, and also chapter 28, I'm going to read these momentarily, but I want to make a few comments. Because Isaiah is also prophesying to northern Israel prior to their captivity, just like Hosea. Now, Isaiah is a cross prophet in the sense of he prophesies to the southern tribe of Judah. And but what you see is he, he prophesies very similarly to, to Hosea. And he makes this comment in chapter 11, verse, uh, chapter 5, verse 11 and 12. And he pronounces a series of woes against Israel. And this one in particular says, Woe to those who rise early in the morning, that they, mo- that they follow intoxicating drink, who continue until night until wine inflames them. The harp and the strings, the tabernacle and the flute and the wine are in their feast. And they do not regard the work of the Lord, nor consider the operation of his hands. Again, what is he capturing here? That intoxica- intoxication dulls the senses, it blurs things in the area of worship, and people cross the line. Chapter 28, verses 1 and verse 7, he pronounces another woe, and he says, Woe to the crown of pride, to the drunkards of Ephraim, whose glorious beauty is a fading flower, which is is at the head of the verdant valleys, to those who are overcome with wine. But they also have erred, erred through the wine intoxicating drink, and they're out of the way. The priest and the prophet have erred, through intoxicating drink. They are swallowed up by wine. They are out of the way through intoxicating drink. They err in vision. They stumble in judgment. So why would, the God, why would God respond so quickly and so firmly to this scene at the very beginning of the sacrificial system, the first one? Because What happens with the priesthood when they become dull? It trickles down to the people and their hearts are become dull as well. So what God is doing is from the very beginning of their journey, making a terrific example of them. And he's not being cold. He's being judicial. He's not being mean-spirited. He's being righteous and he's being just. I think oftentimes when we look at texts like this, we assume that God is not a goodwill fellow, that somehow he's moving against humanity in an unfair way. But to demonstrate here that God is very just in his actions of judgment by sending fire and consuming his representatives here because they have taken lightly God's things. And this reminded me of a parallel story of where things were inaugurated there at Pentecost. You remember the story? You have Barnabas is giving his land and so on for the good and the welfare of this newly inaugurated group of people, this community called the church. And so what happened is Ananias and Sapphira said, man, Barnabas got all this attention. Let's do it too. And he said, well, let's pretend that we give it all. Let's hold some back. So it wasn't wrong to hold some back, but he pretended to give it all. And then his wife was in agreement with him. So at first God kills Ananias and then Sapphira shows up and he kills her too. Now, this scene is a parallel scene at the inauguration of an event like Pentecost and the inauguration of the temple being set up and worship being inaugurated there in Israel. So why was this so important as an example? As an example that God is a holy God and he will not be treated as an unholy God. How he's approached is determined by him. Um, I remember this sign that I saw on my father-in-law's desk way back in the day when he was a business owner before he sold his business, but it said, he who makes the gold makes the rules. He who has the gold makes the rules. 
You know, and here's the deal. He's the boss. He can make the rules. And so if you came into his office to negotiate the rules, it's non-negotiable because he's the boss. And in the same way, God is a holy God, and he does not negotiate with unholy people. Now, he mediates for them through propitiation, through the shedding of the blood of the innocent on behalf of guilty sinners. Does that make sense? All right, so intoxication here is laid out, and it's occurring later on in their history. So why was God making an example? Why is this so critical? Because it's being recorded. And we know this, so whatever things are written before are written for our learning so that we, through patience and the comfort of the Scriptures, might have hope. You may look at the story and say, where the heck is hope in this story? There is hope in this story. Well, let's carry on. So similarly, we had the, the sexual sin that identifies Israel with Egypt and Canaan. There in chapter 8, uh, chapter 18 of Leviticus, you have here that intoxication here is a characterizing the first priests who enter into their duties. So what you see is God designed for the ch children of Israel, these newly liberated Hebrews, that they're to be altar-centered people whose identity revolves around proper worship and is grounded in substitutionary atonement. So you see, altered people live lives of self-restraint in worship. So the intoxication issue and the self-restraint of sexual desire, the incest, the homosexual bestiality unpacked in chapter 18, why is this so important? Because you have to stop and ask yourself, what might the newly liberated Hebrews understand about God and about human nature from the extensive sacrificial offering system and the story about Aaron's sons? The first one is worship is in an alignment with a holy man who's alert and redeemed with a holy God. So how do you see this? Because Abel, what was it? light for Abel to have to come to God through substitutionary atonement. It's the acknowledgement that I am a deeply broken person. It's the humility of saying, I need mediation. I need substitution of innocence on behalf of my personal guilt. And the understanding that worship is coming through God's way, that God has promised to send a seed, then he set up, what is that going to look like by making the first sacrifice? So the sacrifice did not save them. They were looking to that ultimate sacrifice one day, but it was a picture of their faith, their faith in the living God that God accepted on behalf of guilty sinners, people who walk with him by faith and are humble before him will come to him because they have to acknowledge their guilt and God's perfection and the need for a mediation and a mediator. So you have that laid up. So worship is an alignment between a humble, alert, and redeemed heart with a holy God. So what you have here with Abihu and Nadab, you don't have humility. Why? Because they think they can sashay in and do it their own way, just like Cain. I can take fire. It doesn't have to come from the altar. We can go in together, present this on censers here, and God will have to be okay with our offering. Isn't that the attitude of Cain? And it's interesting because, and we've seen this before, we've talked about it, I believe, in 1 John, when, uh, in 1 John, when John is talking about Cain. He said he's like his father of the devil. <laughs> he's proud. So what you have is you have the, at the very opposite of Abel. That's obviously represented and illustrated and characterizes the two sons of Aaron. You see that the same fire that consumes the sacrifice and testifies of God's propitiation devours Aaron's sons in judgment. Now, lest that word propitiation catch you by surprise and you think, I don't even know what that means. I, I just want to unpack it because I also have to look up words as well. So propitiation, another word for expi expiation, is the satisfying of judgment. It's the righteous sentence of the broken law has been executed through substitution that God may therefore show mercy. So when God, the, I guess the best illustration for this is when God told Adam and Eve that if you eat of this tree, you will certainly die. Judgment. Judgment would be passed. Death would have to occur because of their personal guilt. Okay? So if they ate from this tree, they would certainly die. So propitiation is God is accepting the death of another so that he might in turn show mercy to Adam and Eve. Does that make sense? So in the same way, this is exactly the gospel. In order for God to show mercy to broken, dirty, rotten sinners like all of us, 
The penalty of death has to be paid. So instead of us dying for our sin, which we could never die for our sins, you have God accepting the perfect sacrifice of his perfect son, the Lord Jesus Christ, who died as a, <coughs> suffering the penalty for man's sin. So death occurs, but it occurs on behalf of the innocent perfect substitute so that God in turn might have mercy on sinners. So what do you have here? So only the person who walks in humility acknowledges their personal guilt that they have nothing that it will endear them to the living God. Paul makes this statement not by works of righteousness that we've done, but according to his mercy, he saved us. So what you have here is a total misrepresentation of the sacrificial system to all of Israel by those who should represent him most. So you have this explanation here in this story of them coming to God their own way, and God does not accept it. And he moves against them in judgment as an example for the children of Israel. Which leads me to the next point. God's holiness cannot be tampered with. God is a holy God. He's a holy God. He will not be misrepresented by his people. Now, as I was <clears throat> driving over here this morning and uh, feeling the burden of, of yesterday's failure, I mean, because I, all day long I, I struggled with this, and I'm like, I don't, even, I don't even know what to do with the reading this last week. And I was so frustrated. And even this morning, as I'm driving over here, I'm like, uh, well, you know what? I got nothing on this. And the Lord just kind of dropped a little epiphany in my heart. <clears throat> you ready? He said, you are not living water, Iva May. You are not the bread of life. It doesn't depend on you. Jesus, the mediator, he's the only one that can give life. And he's the only one that can produce living water. He's the only one that can rehydrate the soul. He's the only one who will bring life through our veins of spiritual vitality and spiritual reality. It's only he. He is the mediator who stands in the hat on behalf of the, in the gap for people just like me. So what you have here is you have Abraham's sons, Moses' nephews. They are not exempt. You have there is no executive privilege, no ranking of respect that God acknowledges. You either come in humility, but you don't come based on your biological heritage. heritage. You come to him his way. And God will deal with any person, regardless of their ethnicity, their race, their education, if they'll just simply come to him his way. That there's no nepotism in God's economy. I love that. I love that. So what you have here is you see that there are no exemptions or executive privileges in the kingdom of God. <laughs> Moses' nephews and Aaron's two oldest sons still have to come to God, God's way, through substitutionary atonement. <clears throat> Honoring God always trumps familial relationships. That's why Jesus could look at his disciples, and he says, take up your cross daily and follow me. And then he says, if, if anyone refuses to hate his father and his mother and so on, why? He's not saying an endorsing hate to family relationships. No, what he's saying is honor me trumps family relationships. <laughs> Isn't that awesome? So, you know, I get looking to think, with my family, since my identity's not based on my family relationships, my worship isn't either. And my honoring him, I don't have to live in fear of what other people think because they're not even a consideration. When it comes to worship, it kind of frees us from, uh, I'm a man pleaser. What are they gonna think if I raise my hand? And I'm like, woohoo, I'm going to jump up and down, don't care. Uh, but no, I, I want to have dignity in the sense that God is worthy of dignity and honor and respect. Worship demands a humble attitude, a heart that says, I am a guilty, separated sinner. I may have roots and royalty, 
but I still have to come to God God's way. I was thinking about this on the way over this morning because we all been paying attention, if you've been watching the news at all, about the royal household in England. And you have Harry and Meghan Mexit. <clears throat> so they're leaving the whole royal family. It's gonna cost them royally. Anyway, I just had to put that in there. You know, but I was thinking about how when people uh, go, when she, they're invited, they have to be invited to see the queen. They can't just come, say, I'm here, I wanna see the queen. No, then they have to meet, if they're invited, then they have to meet and they have to learn protocol. This is how you address her, this is how you look, this is how you, I mean, the whole thing is all maneuvered and, and learned. And it's just honoring a person. Here's the deal. God is so much more grand and majestic than queen, than any queen or any king that exists. That he's worthy of the protocols that God establishes because he's a holy God. He's a holy God. So therefore, he establishes how he may be worshiped. God is the one that determines how he's approached and how he's honored in worship. You see that intoxication blurs spiritual reality. Therefore, an unguarded heart is an endangered heart. Shouldn't surprise us that the wisdom writer writes, guard your heart with all diligence, for out of it are the issues of life. So when you think about what Paul makes a statement, he says, don't be drunk with wine, but be filled with the Holy Spirit. He's saying, be influenced, but don't be influenced by alcohol. He didn't say you couldn't drink it. He just said, no, but be filled with the Holy Spirit. Why? Just in the way that alcohol has all kinds of influences that dulls our spiritual vitality, what the Holy Spirit does is he hydrates us, gives us life. He influences us for righteousness, to honor God, to exalt his name. And so when Paul talks about this, he says, he, he talks about the need for us to understand that we're going to be influenced by something. But God has created us with a need to worship. If God has created us with a need to worship, he's also given us the protocols and how he must be worshiped because he's a holy God. Now, one day, <laughs> One day when we get to heaven, it's just going to be no barriers at all. But the protocols will not go away. He's still a holy God, worthy of worship. And worship in a way that declares, like the angels do from all eternity, holy, holy, holy is the Lord. To him belongs reverence and honor and glory because he's a holy God. He is separate other than humanity. He is not like we. Is that right, Penny? He's not like we, like us. He is not like us. He's very other, different. So therefore, we treat him with reverence. We come boldly to the throne of grace. I imagine Prince William, hey, Gran, where everyone else calls her your majesty. He probably says, hey, royal Gran, I don't know. But there's a family relationship with royalty, and it's a game changer. It's if you're part of the family. It doesn't take away their royal position. It just says that you now on intimacy with royalty. It's pretty cool, isn't it? Well, as we close this time in prayer, I was thinking about Paul's statement in 1 Corinthians chapter 8. I think it's verse 23. And let me just look it up because I can't trust my brain. It's a little getting older and it's harder to pull things out. <clears throat> But he talks about not being slave to anything, having a, a, a tender conscience. He says, um, verse 9, uh, chapter 8, he says, But beware, lest somehow this liberation of yours becomes a stumbling block to those who are weak. For if anyone sees you who have knowledge eating in an idol's temple, will not the conscience of him who is weak be emboldened to eat those things offered to idols? And because of your knowledge, shall the weak brother perish from whom Christ died? But when you that sin against your brother and wound their weak conscience, you sin against Christ. Therefore, if food makes any brother stumble, I will never again eat meat lest I make my brother stumble. And so what Paul is talking about, you know, and he's not, when he gives this mandate following the deaths of Nadab and Abihu about intoxication, he's not saying you can't drink. He's saying don't be intoxicated. 
So what you have to say is, if, is there anything that I do that I'm permitted to do, but it brings harm to me spiritually or harms another person, then I have to withhold from doing. And so had they really understood, and they, I'm sure they did because they had the stories of old, they knew about the evil influence of idolatry, the evil influence of being intoxicated. They knew the story of, of, of uh, Noah. They knew these stories. They were warned. They also knew and understand that God had described in earlier, I think it's in chapter 6 of Leviticus, or maybe it's chapter 3, that um, the incense offering what it was to look like and how it was, was to be presented. They knew. What happened is their intoxication blurred their spiritual understanding. And they thought they could just, because of who as they were, that it would be okay for them to interpret their way and come to God their own way. And God killed them. The same example occurs in the New Testament beyond Ananias and Sapphira. Because what you have is God, Jesus has established the Lord's Supper. And then he also gives a warning with commemorating the Lord's death and burial and resurrection through the taking of bread and the drinking of wine. He says, if any of you do it in an unworthy manner, there is always a prohibition that follows an instruction. Why is that? Because God is protecting us. Because he is a holy God. And he loves us. He's protecting us and helping us walk so that we live a life fruitful. That we have a life of honor and respect and dignity. So as I close this time, is there any area in your life that God could just like put his finger on the pulse? And just saying, you have liberty to do this, but you're hurting other people. You're hurting your witness. You're making God look less holy than he really is. Now, that in no way is a, not a true measurement with what happened with Nadab and Abihu at all. But to understand it, God doesn't ever withdraw his redemption from our lives. We're saved through the shedding of the blood of the innocent on behalf of the guilty. What Jesus has done is a once and for all offering. We never have to worry about losing that. But we can lose fellowship with him. And we can hurt other people in the process. I want to conclude with this one illustration that happened to us years ago. We um, always had seminary students at our house. <clears throat> the single people, and they'd come over once a month, and we'd have pizza and fun and playing games and whatever. And they're invited. They were able to invite their friends if they wanted to as well. And, um, and so we knew all those had signed up, and so we felt really good about playing uh, the games that we had on our table. And one was poker with chips <clears throat> and pennies. And we didn't think anything about it, so we're playing and having a good time. And then uh, later, a couple days later, one of the girls, she contacted my husband and said, because she had brought her boyfriend, whom we didn't know at that time. And we did not know that he, was a, he had a gambling addiction. And he fell off the wagon at our house. We never stop and think, is my freedom, is my liberty to do something, is it helpful? Does it honor the image of God in someone else? Does it cause them to stumble? So when God took out their lives and recorded in his scripture, it said that Isaiah and Hosea both have to address the intoxication in the priesthood. They didn't learn their lesson. Now, God did not move against those prophets in Hosea's day, in Isaiah's day, and killed them like he did the two sons of Aaron, but they were judged. In the judgment they received, they also were not spared the captivity that the nation experienced. Leviticus teaches us a difference between what's clean and what's unclean, what's holy and what's unholy. And there's so much at stake here because God is seeking to dwell amongst a broken people 
to fulfill the promise that God has made to Abraham, that through these people, that all the nations will know that he is God. And that they will see and understand substitutionary atonement. That God has made a way for broken, alienated people to have a relationship with the living God through substitutionary atonement. So there's so much at stake in this story, and that's why God moves so harshly in judgment. And he forbids Moses and Aaron from leaving the tent of meeting and from shedding a tear. Because it would be a tragedy to weep over something that God has judged so harshly, even if it's within the family. We ought to be more concerned about the honor of God's great name. And that's the point he was making there, that God is worthy of honor. Amen? Father, Lord, we thank you for your word. God, my confidence is in your word that it will not return to you void, but it does accomplish what you please and prosper in the things that you sent it. Lord, I thank you that uh, I can't even get my head around your holiness. I think I'll just weep for all eternity when I see how indeed holy you are. You're worthy of the people who honor you and worship you and praise you and exalt you. Come to you your established way to bring fame to your name. Lord, help us to be the people of God in the hour in which we live. There's so much at stake. Help us to be influenced by truth and righteousness and peace and justice. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen.